Right, I'm here for another episode in my interview series on my second channel called Thor Inquiry. And my guest for this one is TB, and he is, I, I'll say it, I, I consider him a legendary drum and bass producer. But let's start there, actually, because obviously, I know you're someone, I've noticed you and Calix both do this, where if anyone ever asks you in an interview about like the origins of your musical career or whatever, like a lot of artists, you don't want to be pigeonholed into a genre or a subgenre or a scene. So you're always, you're always, I notice, stressing like, you know, oh, I used to like this jazz music from the 70s or, you know, I liked funk music from whatever. You know, you're trying to show off a bit of the range, you know, so it's not just drum and bass because you don't want people to think you just make one little type of music. But I do notice if people look at the people who we might consider your musical, spiritual predecessors as they were mm -hmm. they are from the the sub genre that some of you might want to escape which is the sort of techier side of drum and bass the darker side these are all terms actually i'm even dating myself by referencing like that tv no one says dark drum and bass anymore that's like something from the early 2000s but you know what i mean so my question is this why initially was that the type of drum and bass that you you connected with why are we drawn to that do you think I think when it comes to music and, 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 and my interest started really, really early, um, I was, I was kind of, I was into the immediate and I was into what most of my peers were into growing up, but really early on, I got into to science fiction and, um, I think the ominous sort of sounds and the background, the, sort of the background music and the scores for like the you know sci-fi movies from the from the eighties and the nineties had a much bigger influence on on where I was going to go in my career and and what I wanted to sound like than anything else. Um, and and also I'm more sort of a person. I'm not so bothered about what chord you're playing. Right. I kind of I kind of like the way the fingers move between the chords. The sound that the fingers you know, make. So I'm more about the space between the notes than the notes itself. And, and sometimes if you have something ominous and unsettling, you know, music usually is about love and and you know sure. about tragedy or you know about overcoming this and that, but. I, I tend to gravitate towards music that don't tell me how to feel. Yes. Um, so, so really early on, it was that sort of like, you know, if I can sort of really affect someone in a, in a, in a, in a way they wouldn't expect with my music, that's kind of where I wanted to go. So, so, so I can't, I, I guess that's it. You know, it's kind of hard to pinpoint why it became a bit darker, but it's just those sounds that I'm drawn to. I can listen to a drone for 20 minutes but with, with slight, slight subtle movements. It doesn't need to be a melody. I actually find that stuff really, really soothing. Um, and, and it just, it just stayed with me. You know, I'm into, I'm into micro editing. I'm into waveforms, you know, I'm into creating my own waveforms. I'm into, uh, I don't know. Every time I hear something that's unfamiliar to my ear, they, they perk up immediately. Right. And, and, and that's kind of what I try to do, at least with certain aspects of my music. I mean, at the end of the day, it is music. Uh, and if there's not something there that you can sort of think back and explain, then it's not music. So, so you've got to have what I call a ghost loop, something, you know, if you've had a really good night out or something like that, and you've sure. had a great night in a club and, and you come home and there's something sort of looping in your head, but you don't know quite what yes. it is that's 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 the ghost loop that's what i try and, and recreate recreate in, in most of my compositions and as the backbone but that for me has to be something so simple that you might not even notice it the first few times around and and i, I guess that's it it's just it's just that unknown thing you know science fiction the future you know yes. i try to make music that 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 doesn't necessarily have a time and a place but it but it has a certain feel you know, actually, I've, I remember hearing in another interview you did, I think you actually inadvertently came up with probably the funniest but most apt description of like techie drum and bass, where you were talking about, I think, Ed Rush and Optical. And you said that like, because you were trying to explain that, you know, they're not just the sci-fi sort of aesthetic. They've also got funk in there, you know. Yeah. But you said, you, the way you described it was you said, yes, it is like a bunch of robots going ape shit on a spaceship, but yeah. there's funk behind it as well. It's like, that's, that is the best way to describe that style yeah. of drum and bass because everything's, you know, a quote from Blade Runner or something out of an anime or something yeah, on top of yeah. just the most futuristic sounds you can come up with right yeah absolutely absolutely and, and and that is what it is you know like i was always into sort of like the more sort of futuristic sounding stuff i mean i, I come from i guess i come from hip-hop initially that was my first love was you know i was break dancing and when that culture hit scandinavia i was all over it it was something fresh and and something i wanted to be a part of but that 
sort of naturally led into the extension of rave music. And the moment I discovered rave music, it was like the floodgates opened, like Orbital was the first sort of one that really grabbed me. And, and, sure. and then I moved into the early catalogue of extra recordings and, and such. And, and, and that sort of unknown, again, sort of futuristic, like daydream yourself away to another time or like, you know, a, a, a moment where you can just be whatever you want to be, however you want to be. Um, sort of disregarding time and time and place that's what i want music to be that's what it is for me it's like the ultimate escape from from everything sort of nagging me you know and and, and that's how it's always been and and i guess to this point i'm i'm still more concerned about what's up and out there rather than what's on on this 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 sure. we call home you know it's just it's a lifelong obsession of mine and 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 yeah robots ro robots need funk too right of course, exactly. No, well, actually, a funny an area I can actually kind of relate when I've heard you in interviews is because obviously you're at the point now in your career where if you look at other people in the drummers, feel I'm sure if you wanted to be at this point in time, you could just become a producer for pop music. You could, there's all sorts of things you could. I've heard you talk about where you had offers to do musical scores and stuff as like side projects. But I have noticed no matter what happens in your career you're always going to be drawn back to some of those elements of that type of drum and bass you always loved. And the reason why I can relate is because I, I imagine it must have something to do with your origins because I come from the northeast of England, right? And even though now, you know, if I am if I go an hour north to Newcastle, there's digital, right? There's one big club that might have some drum and bass on, etc. But there's not much. And especially when I was growing up, it was all in London, which for me may as well, may, may as well be another country. It's like, you know, so many hours away by train. I didn't have a lot of money. To, so as a result, just like actually how I got into the esports field and got really, I'm still there 20 years later, yeah. because I, it was so scarce to me and it was like this other world that I could just glimpse into. I was like the little kid walking in the street on Christmas Day, looking through the window at the family with all their, you know, amazing like present stuff and thinking, oh, if only that was me. It meant that when I finally did get there and I was in a, a world where I could embrace this, I could be part of it. I think I appreciated it more. And so there's a part of it to me will always be a little bit extra special. Whereas I don't know if I would have had that, you know, if it had been on the street corner and it was just, you know, the people where you meet them at a drum and bass night and it's like, they don't actually even know anyone who's on the card, which is a totally valid way to live your life, you know. But to, if you're like an aficionado, you're like, what are you, what are you talking about? Do you know that's Black Sun Empire? What are you, you know, is, is, is there some element of this coming from Norway, being a bit disconnected from the scene early on? There is. There are massive, massive reasons for that. I mean, first and foremost, I was Norwegian and I, I stumbled upon this music on a, on, a, on a school trip over to England. That's when I picked up the first first white labels. I mean, I was I was already a DJ at the time, but I guess it was more hip hop and other stuff. Sure. And, and I just discovered a, a few white labels and I can't remember the name of the record shop, but it was in Newcastle because we took the boat over from Bergen on a, on a class trip when, when I was in the ninth grade and, um, and picked up these white labels and I start, you know, could not find out what it was, but it was this music. It was like the, the sort of attitude of hip hop, but it was a bit faster. It was a bit scary. And it, it, and it just felt, it just felt, it just resonated with me like nothing else. And in Norway, no one had heard of this. No one even knew what it was. So, so what I ended up doing was getting my dad's record player, phoning record stores around England, you know, from, from like literally looking up the, the, the uh, yellow pages. Yes, that sure. Made sent over to me because there was no, I couldn't go on the internet and search yes. for it. Uh, so, so I literally rang record shops and I played records down the, down the, down the phone to them that, that I loved. And I asked if they had something similar. And then it was also the matter of, you know, most record sh st stores back then didn't accept credit cards. I couldn't use my dad's card to pay for this or nothing. I had to send money orders over from them. So literally I'd be on the phone to record stores in England, having them play me music back, <laughs> then figure out what the total was, having to make out money orders, send them and then wait for weeks, sometimes months for the records to show up. And 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 because I had to fight so hard to be a part of it in the first place, it, it, it just meant so much more to me. This was my thing. I found something abroad and something that really connected with me. And, and I was always the kid who was a little bit here and a little bit there. I mean, the one thing that's been constant in my life is is, is music and, and my love for martial arts. Besides that, I was a chameleon drifting in and out of everything. Right. That was like the point in time where I found something that just 
click with me immediately and then that sort of spiraled and and I, and I started hustling and got on, on on mailing lists early on every time I got a promo it was Christmas you know free music something that the kids today will never know what it what, what, what was like for us you know we had to pay you know that my allowance was a 12 inch a week basically right and and that's what all my money my money went to but to, to, to sort of like fast forward a little bit, that was the start of everything. And then one day I kind of just woke up and I was never, I never wanted to be a producer. I just wanted to be a part of this music and I love DJing. And it was just a really nice group of friends in, in Norway that was all into this new sort of like technology of DJing. And, and, and sure. the first Amigas came around and we had Optimed and all of a sudden we had like six tracks and we could start sampling stuff. And it was just amazing. Um, and then, um, yeah, one thing led to another. And one day I just woke up realizing I didn't really have that many records I wanted to play anymore. So just the spur of the moment thing, I asked my dad if he could buy a computer because I kind of wanted to try and, and learn how to make music. So he gave me a loan. And, and yeah, I guess the rest kind of is, is history in itself. That's, I guess I really found myself when I started making music because it came came really natural to me and because I don't have a musical background at all and I've avoided it as well because I like the fact that I don't and sometimes things that are not harmonic sounds more pleasing to me than a major chord right um so 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 ultimately yeah yeah here I am today still doing this but but yeah the start of it was definitely being removed also being in Bergen on the west coast third rainiest city in the world you know the the weather was always dark and gloomy and, and the winters were long and cold. And it, it, it just allows for a lot of daydreaming and it, it allows for a lot of sort of, I spent a lot of time with myself and, 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 and just, just exploring this music and exploring music that I realized these artists had sampled, you know, like because I heard source, early Source Direct records, early Photek records, early Goldie records. And, and as you get a record, you kind of automatically think, wow, this is an amazing composition. And then I started realizing, well, most of this is actually stuff that <laughs> yes. cycled. I was like, hang on a minute, how does that work? Because I felt that I was cheating in a way. But then I, I obviously fully embraced it. And, um, and um, yeah, I started digging into like, where's this sample from? Where's that from? And, and in that way, I discovered the sort of hidden origins to a lot of our music. I discovered dub, reggae, I discovered ambient, I discovered certain aspects of techno. Um, uh, and, and, and yeah, I realized that the drum and bass is such a beautiful place to be because the only thing that sort of holds us together is the tempo. Um, Yes, but, but besides that, you can pull in whatever you want and, and just like mold it into your own creation. And, and to this day, that's still my favorite part of it. Yes. Well, actually, something from your, your past again, obviously, we'll, we'll skip forward soon. But one thing I want to ask you about was I, another person from this era who I was actually a very, very much a, a fan of was your mate Paula, who obviously oh, you did a lot of the yeah. early collaborations with. And the reason I want to ask about that was, obviously it's quite unique because you were both coming out of Norway and for anyone who isn't aware watching this interview, yeah. Scandinavia in general isn't particularly big on drum and bass to this day. Like no, no. it's never really been the type of music over there. So you had two people coming out like this. And what I find so interesting is like, I, I like a lot of his stuff, but it's so different from your solo stuff. Your solo work is so, so different. So then when I listened to the collab stuff early on, that's different from both aspects. Like, it's nothing like either of your solo stuff. And in fact, because obviously it was the earliest kind of origins of the music you were doing, as anyone who's a modern day TV fan knows, like, production value is one of the biggest things you really, like, put behind your standard. Well, obviously, back then, this is easily the most dated music you ever made. I mean, some of those sounds, they, they don't hold up if, if 20 years later, you know, the music might be good, but it does sound like someone initially foraging into it. So why, why did you do collab stuff initially, you know? Obviously, you had a long streak where you were just a solo artist. Like, and can you tell me anything about what, what was the relationship with this guy like? Right. So, 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 uh, so, Kay Chiatel Paula, he um, he lived a few houses houses up from mine in the village, and he's a couple of years younger than me. And he was just part of this whole group of people that we were in. He was actually not the best one. There was another guy called Jans. Uh, his name was Doc David. Uh, he did one release with us on Rugged Vinyl in '96 on our Quicksilver EP, he had one side, Kay had one side, I had one side, and I can't remember what the last side, last side was. Oh, it was another guy from Bergen as well. So there was literally like an EP 
that that got released on rugged vinyl from our click but, but the thing with chetil was he was kind of a misunderstood kid and quite quiet but he had an insane talent for making music um and and, and i just you know we, we were just in the same group and 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 we started hanging out more and more and we were we were so different me and chetil he's He's sort of closed back, quite reflective, doesn't really say anything unless it has to be said. Well, I'm the opposite. I, I blurb out a bunch of stuff I usually have to take back. Sure. And, and it, it's, I like that because he kind of he kind of pulled me in a little bit. And also he was younger. And I thought to myself, well, I don't really I don't really like hanging out with, with, with kids that are younger than me, especially not the ages like 15 and 16. You kind of want to, you know, preferably older people, you know, because you want to sure. be an adult. But he had like a really sort of old soul on him. Um, and he taught me how to, how to use a music program um, first on. But the reason we didn't collaborate until later was because he actually didn't think I was good enough. Uh, okay. and, also, and also the first ever release we did on another label called, called A-Level, they mislabeled it. So, so I was on one side, he was on the other, but I got credit for his work. Right. Got credit for mine. And that was before he was K or Polar. And he was so ashamed of, of being credited with my tune back then, he changed his name. <laughs> <laughs> and, okay. uh, and, uh, and yeah, he because he was called Blue Notice at, at blue note at first or blue notes or whatever it was that was his first name but i got credit for his tunes which which and, and his tunes were good but the other side was really crap so my career kind of lifted up from that mistake i always felt really bad about that um but yeah that that, that was the start of us and, and and then um later on i introduced him to the labels i got signed on you know he got signed on certificate 18 and did one or two albums on there the same label i did two albums on and and then he moved to San Francisco in like, when was it, 2003? And we just drifted apart. I mean, I still talk to him a couple of times a year, but 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 that 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 just happened. We we just drifted apart, and and he kind of fell out of love with music. He also has a, a problem with tinnitus and uh, yes. he's hypersensitive, so he can't really make music anymore, um, which is a which is a damn shame. Because By the way, actually, I want to ask about that because that's another thing. As, as someone who followed his career, I was quite aware that that's one of the reasons he sort of like uh, stepped back from production. Isn't that something that you've implied, like you've had sort of like close calls with? Haven't you had issues with tinnitus at times? Yeah, I, I mean, as we're sitting here right now, I, it's it's we it's 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 howling. But as long as it doesn't hinder my technicality and my ability to to um, to make a, a finished product. I can't walk around thinking about it because that will drive me insane. Um, now I started wearing earplugs in clubs and everywhere about 15 years ago, but the damage was already done yeah, for me. Sure. Um, I mean, I've had hearing tests. It's not so severe. My tops are a little bit more rolled off than, than most people my age. And I have a couple of dips and I have a couple of frequencies where it's actually that's dead. Um, cause I've been in a car accident for instance. So I, um, I managed to root to, to, to break one of my eardrums. So, so my left ear is, um, it's about sort of 60%. Um, but, but I'm so used to it now. And, and also there's so many great visual tools that yes. I use alongside every minute of my production because, because you can't discuss taste, whether something like someone likes someone or not, that's entirely up to them, but you can discuss good and bad production. So I just want to make sure that the one aspect where I can be safe, I can hold my own, you know what I'm saying? Yes. And so, so that's that's why. I, and also, I love that aspect of it, the whole technicality, the the nerd bit of making music. It, it really fascinates me uh, massively, and, and not just not just to the point of because you know now most people make music inside the computer, sure. and, and, and you know there's there's no one telling a a, a 17 year old Russian kid in his mum's kitchen on a pair of headphones that sounding like noisier or myself is hard. He will find a way. And, and I think that's beautiful in, in itself. Um, but for me, I'm, I'm more into um, people who are so dedicated that they build physical units. And I still think that, that hardware and, and, and are much better for, for most tasks. Um, hence why there's never enough money in the pot. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Okay. Well, uh, along these lines, then, when you started doing all your solo stuff, yeah. right? Again, obviously, this is the beginning of the whole production origins and figuring out the technology, etc. 
much like a lot of people from that era, I noticed that a lot of the early stuff is like you kind of have like a base of stock samples and sounds, and that's how you create the sound initially, you know. So anyone who can think of like the Black Science Labs era and the first subtitles release is going to know what I'm referring to. Like yeah. none of these songs are the same, but they all kind of, it's like they're sort of like brothers and sisters of each other. They yeah. definitely have like certain sounds that repeat or certain types of sound. Yeah. Like what was the philosophy like back then? Was it just too difficult to create lots of new songs? Did he specifically want to have certain sounds that just obsessed you or something? Well, the thing is when I first, uh, the first piece of equipment that I bought um, after just running, uh, what was it called? Fast Tracker on the PC. Uh, when I sort of started getting serious was I bought my first EMU sampler, which was an EXS32 which didn't even have a, a display. It just had, so I couldn't see the waveforms or nothing. Uh, but that's what I had. And that's the only thing I had to make music on the way I knew it should be made. So I, I, I and I also had an old keyboard so I could trigger it via MIDI. And, and what that did was I had to use my ears so much more than, than because I didn't have the visual aspect of actually, if I, if I loaded in a, a break, I'd sample off a record or something, I couldn't see it. I had to listen to it. Uh, uh, and in listening to it, I had to find all the different chop points and stuff. And, and you know, even just like a, a four second loop would take me maybe two hours to slice correctly and get it right. But with that as well, I experimented with pitch, I experimented with timber. And, and I found, because back then I didn't really have the equipment that I do right now, like, like Superior Drummer, for instance, I can I have access to to like ten thousand drum kits, and then again I can mold those drum kits into whatever I want it to be, tune each individual hit without having to be a drummer. But because I know the science of, of how a drum kit should sound, I can pretty much get out what's in my head now. But back then, I gravitated towards things and sounds that made me feel a certain way. So when, when I found something really good and, and slightly maybe changed the pitch of it because my, my options were limited, I didn't even have an EQ back then. I didn't get that until um, right before I started writing Black Science Labs. And, um, and I guess it's, it was just the timber and the way it made me feel. And I wanted that to be, from the very start, I wanted the, the way my music felt to have a, 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 a red line. So it was always, you could always relate to who had done this. Like my, right. I think all great artists as well, and, and I still aspire to that. Not only do they have great music, but they have a specific tone. And I think the search for your tone goes throughout your entire life. And the tone is the identity, not only in your track, but in the way you mix it. I mean, I could outsource this. I could not be so incredibly obsessive and probably get engineers to do, do things for me and it would go quicker. But for me, the search for that tone is, is the very lifeblood of, of why I'm doing this, because that tone is a natural extension of who I am. And, and I need that to be a red line in my music. And I've been very focused on that from, from, the, from the first moment. That hence why recreating, uh, using or getting really to know new sounds, but making it interesting by reusing them in, in many different ways to, to give them more life. You know, everything today is very disposable. Um, but I don't think music should be. I think music should be um, should be the, the the antidote to all of that stuff that's that's disposable. And and I guess that's that. that I mean that that pretty much sums it up. I wanted a certain tone and a certain character. So yeah. And also, I only had eight megs of RAM. I only had so much time. <laughs> right. Like like a trick I learned later on was literally to to, to rec like if I sampled funk breaks or whatever from vinyl i would speed the record up to do the point where you it just sounded like like dribble and then three seconds of that when i started slowing it down in the song nice. all of a sudden i had like 25 seconds of something and that's when i realized i could i could for instance brian eno records that i could literally get 20 seconds of one of his ambient pads floating into two seconds of sample time um so yeah i, I just got creative with it um and, and I, I guess that's why. So another hallmark, as I alluded to, of your career. I mean, when when someone's trying to be an artist, as you say, even just finding their voice can be a lifelong journey, getting even good at actually making the music sound good. These are all different skill sets. But one of the hallmarks that you've put a lot of emphasis in is production value. Mm -hmm. And people might have, if they've heard any of the interviews with you, like sadly, this one isn't online anymore, I noticed. But when you did an interview with the guy from Ordees, that's like a mate of yours. Yeah, yeah, it's a yeah. very, very nerdy interview. But it, what people will learn from this is... 
you're literally spending all your savings buying the new equipment because you're yeah. trying it's the quest for the unattainable the next level of perfection to the sound right the different aspect to it right why is this something that's so appealing to you because there's still a lot of really great drum and bass djs to this day who yeah. you know what you wouldn't notice that it's not that well produced but if you hear someone where they really have nailed every aspect of it, and if, I remember hearing this podcast you did with, uh, I think, Matt Lange, actually, where you, talk, you were talking about how you literally by hand drawing all the waveforms yeah. in, stuff that's incredibly tedious. I mean, you even sort of joke in that, like, you just become a nerd staring into a computer screen for hours and hours. It's like, this, it's almost like being a monk of making music, right? There's an aspect of sacrifice where some people would say, is it worth it? But to you, it is, right? I mean, I'm a sound boy. This is what I do. I mean, I'm a sound boy. Like for me, every single day is a sound clash. That's the core of drum and bass culture. It's, it's you know, you're clashing. You know, you're going out. Who can draw sound the hardest? Who can be the one that, that just wipes out everyone? You know, that's what it is. That's the drive. You know, I come from martial arts as well, which is so deeply rooted in me. And, and, and it's that. I mean, the, the only drive I have, which has always been prominent, regardless of what's been going on in my life, is that if I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it. I'm not going to do it halfway. I'm going to go all the way with it. And I've found something that I genuinely love. I mean, when I'm sitting here working and having the most frustrating days where I may be going down the wrong path for three days, realizing I've made everything worse, I'm still loving every aspect of it. Like the aspect of what I do, and that is why I invest that money in it, because I want the edge. I want to I, I want to be able to have something that you don't have. And, and to get that, I had to make a rather large sacrifice. And that means that that unit, instead of ones and zeros on a screen or a cracked plugin, that physical unit means something to me. And also I am giving back to the people enabling me to make my music better. And, and that in itself, you know, I'm so grateful for these people sourcing um you know op amps in eqs sourcing the right um the right valves for their valve gear you know i just bought some some 1955 like quadruple set of nos valves from russia for like a small fortune because they tested 99 percent or better and when i put them in my opto compressor this is a one-off that, that i've had made um it's just like the way those valves sounded and, and when I when I sent the right current through them and started processing the sounds was exactly what I was dreaming it would do when I when I got those valves. So I'm always looking at like how can I Im how can I improve every aspect of what I have so I can get my vision out completely? Because I am not in this for money. If I was in this for money, I would not do drum and bass. You know, luckily, I've, I've been able to make a good living from it. And I've positioned myself in a way where I am comfortable. But, you know, I'm by no means a millionaire. You know what I'm saying? Sure. It's like it's like the whole drive and the culture behind it. I didn't just fall in love with the music. I fell in love with everything that comes with it. Um, and, and the culture is, is just an extension of me. And, and, and I think my way of saying thank you to all of it is, is by trying to be the best that I can be. And, and, and that's why I, I end up spending all this money on it. I don't have to, I, I'm sure I could get a result that was literally 95% there inside the computer with, with, with what's readily available, but it's those 5% I'm always looking for those 5% to improve myself, whether that is if I'm out skateboarding or if I'm out running or, you know, if I'm driving my car, I'm always looking at aspects to, to try and improve because, because why wouldn't I, <laughs> you know, I mean, that's what drives sure. me. I just want to be, I just want to find a balance where I, where I'm comfortable, but I have to have a, a, a friendly competition with myself or else to, to stagnate or feel, feel old. It, it's like literally my worst fear. Like, it's like I have to drive. It's my, it's my life force. In that vein, then, this would be an appropriate time to ask this question I've always wanted to ask. I remember a long, long time ago, you did an interview where you said in exactly this vein that when you did the album, The Legacy, back in, I think it was like 2004, 2005, that sort of time period, you, you said that on the song Tsunami that you spent months figuring out this bass line. Like, not a week, not two weeks, not months. What... What were you really doing for months with this bass? Like, what wasn't perfect about it? How, why, how did it take this long to get to? Because it is a great bass line, but, you know, yeah. if I asked someone to guess, I'm sure they'd be like, oh, what was that, you know, a week, yeah, a little bit of time? Well, that's not a sample. You know, that, that is created, that bass line is created out of a saw wave and a sine wave. 
Um, and if, if you know um, music theory, like the sound, the sound of a sign is quite rounded and, and quite big sounding, but the sound of a saw can be quite abrasive, but they are constant. So like for me, for instance, like one of my problems with a lot of, um, lots of electronic music is the static feel of it. Like for me and, and, and to my ears, if, if things have a subtle movement and never repeat itself, over and over again, it's it's much more pleasing. And that also makes working on something that's extremely monotonous, uh, bearable, because because of the, because it doesn't become about the melody, it becomes of the texture. And it goes back to what I said to you earlier about tone, about fan, finding, finding your tone. Like that, doing that bass, I learned so much through frustration, but I really got out a feeling in the bass line that, that I wanted in, in the texture and the movement of it. And that took like, there's literally, I don't know, there's literally, there was 50 or 60 layers um, of subtle movement to, uh, and with, with loads of filtering, loads of running through processes. I even at one point had a DAP player in my living room, just recording the room, the, the sound of the bass coming into my living room and then cutting out all the mid information. And I was left with this side blanket that was kind of nondescript, but then I, then I, I imported that and I started distorting that. And then I started, emulating that with LFOs and sending that to new reverbs and panning and blending it in with what I had just so subtle. And it ended up sounding like, you know, the baseline sounds like an electrical fuse being fed to a, to a really angry sea creature. <laughs> and it's like, that's kind of what I'm after. I'm after trying to make something that you can't put your finger on what it is. Everyone can hear a guitar. Everyone can hear a bass guitar. Everyone can hear a drum kit. But like the sounds that I want to play the melodies and be the core of my music, I, I don't want you to be able to identify unless it's on purpose. You know, if I use a wind instrument or a sax or if I have an amazing trumpet player like Nils Petamova on the track, sure. or you obviously want, want them to have, have the space for them. But when it comes to me, I want to take, because I'm not also, because I'm not musically trained. It's like, I'm, I'm trying to break all those rules. So just to come up with something where it's like, oh, this is making me feel the way I want to. And that's why it took so long. Same thing when I did them, um, which again was an impossible task. When Fotek asked me to remix Nita Nichirio, Two, Two Swords Technique, that for, for a drum and bass artist, that track is like the Bible. Um, you know, at the time when that came out, it was, it was that charted and, and it hasn't even got a melody. Sure. It was just... It was just like some future tribal. It, it literally sounded like if you entered another planet and that was the sound of their fighting, but it was still the greatest piece of art I ever heard. Like that track, that remix took me six months too. Um, and, and that was because I was trying to at least reach the level that Rupert, Rupert did. And I was working with, with Photic at the time as well. Uh, and he just out of the blue asked me me to do it, and I, I said no at first because I was like, "There's no way I can do this." But sure. but I, I did it, and it was well received. But but yeah, that that's why. I mean, I have things that I'm working on right now for this next record, where the idea itself was started in the '90s, and it's like, as you progress as an artist, the the the, the thing I learned the most is. If you create something that you believe in, it should still work 10 years down the line. So I do a lot yeah. of small like time periods where I, I make stuff and then I put it on three different hard drives. I take them out of my room and I literally forget about them. I forget about them until maybe one, two, sometimes even three or four years later when I go sure. back and listen to them. And 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 okay that wasn't so good that didn't stood the test of time but the ones who did those are the one i take in and i start grafting and 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 some of these tracks coming on this next record have taken like seven or eight years to finish uh and and it doesn't sound like it but for me to get each component the way i wanted it to it had to take that long um so, so yeah that's probably not so much what people want to hear who starts making music but sure. but it, but, but it, it is like if, you, if you're going to get into this business and if you if you're serious about it and you're coming in for the right reasons like this, this stuff is hard like this stuff is it, it, it's all you know I've, I've had to forego of most friends and, and and most family and everything because it's so time consuming to do this but i wouldn't have it any other way i i i love this you know sure 
So obviously people who are more familiar with your more modern work will be yeah. entirely aware that you collaborate with Calyx. Yeah. But that's another thing that actually at this point in time, and we were talking about going back 15 years for that now. Mm. Now, an aspect I wanted to ask about with this is it ties into actually the, the aspect you were talking about with the baselines there, because even though he came from a different place, like anyone, one of the interesting things about his music is the jump up in the quality of his music is insane. Like if you hear the very, very first drum and bass tracks he did, they weren't very good, mate. Like the quality was very, very bad. And in yeah. fact, I remember one track he did, it was called Compression. It's yeah. just a bass. It's a, you can literally hear the bass line. It's just, he obviously just played it himself and sampled it on a very bad sampler and then made a track. If you then go literally maybe a year later, he's already doing the kind of bass lines we're talking about. In fact, he was one of the people I, th I thought had a similar type of philosophy, it seemed like, to the bass lines. They got very, very high production quality. And as you say, they had an element where it wasn't just a traditional, like, this is just a bass line. It's like it's, there's a movement to it. It becomes like the central part of the track almost. And obviously, coincidentally, this is exactly when you two collaborate and start doing all this stuff together. So... How, what would you say about this guy? Like, why why collaborate with this person? And, and crucially, beyond just collaborate a bit, why eventually make it like a permanent partnership? Because for people who don't know, at the time that you made the collaboration, this really was like a big marquee matchup. These are two people who were prolific in solo world saying we're going to completely join our brands together. Mm. I mean, it was, I've, I've known Larry for a very long time. When, uh, the first label I signed to was, uh, well, the second label. The, the, the second label I signed to was Rugged Vinyl. And I actually met Larry and his then partner, because Calix used to be two people. Yes. Um, in, in, in the office in, in 95, in the Rugged Vinyl office. And we just struck a really good tone. And, and it's funny you say that about, about Larry uh, and the way he, he sort of like got there quite quickly because, because, we, we 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 stayed friends. I was every time I was in England, I stayed at his place, and and I, I just spent a lot of time with him. Played him a lot of music. We talked a lot about music. I talked about how I did my things. He talked about how he did his things. But we were still very much focused on our own stuff, and I think he needed it at the time as well. And and then Calix, you know, round about the time he was he, he just before he started writing his No Turning Back album. Um, they split up and, and and the other guy, Chris, was was more of the engineer type in that relationship. So nice. Larry had to force himself to understand how that worked. And and I spent a lot of time as well with him, explaining to him how I did things and he did his own take on it. So I kind of I kind of kind of helped him out a little bit early on. But 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 that goes both ways. He he sure incredible musician like he has perfect pitch he's a trained jazz guitarist amazing jazz guitarist and he plays a saxophone he's amazing on keys and and you know as we all know now he's also a fantastic singer um and, but it was the friendship at the core of it the understanding and, and where we came from and and how we bonded because you know he we came from different worlds he came from jazz and rock and and indie and, and that sort of world and and i came from like hip-hop and and, and and sort of b-boying and, and and like early rave days and we bonded over this one thing that was connected within the culture that that is drum and bass and 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 and, and we just became brothers you know i really and we're, we're yin and yang like he has so many strengths that i don't and and i have have ways of thinking and ways of doing that that, that he couldn't do and i think when we started working together the first track we made was absolutely crap I mean, we, we were like, oh, my God, this isn't working. We can't work together. We suck. But the second track we made was Follow the Leader. Yes. Uh, and and, and we, we Which is started. timeless. That, that'll still hold up today if anyone goes and listens to that one. Yeah, That's a good one. Crazy. Especially if you like hip-hop music. Yeah, and fortunately, Joaquin got most of the money for that. Um, <laughs> but, but, you know, that was, in, that, was the, that was the ad track for Midnight Club 3 in all, like, all over the world. All right. Uh, on, all, on TV everywhere. But... Rakim got 90% of everything that track ever made. But then again, if I'd remove that Rakim sample... It wouldn't be the same. Be the no. same. And that's when we come back to those 5%, you know, like what's sort of like, what's that little thing that tips it over the edge? And, and in this case, it was the Rakim sample. Um, but yeah, that's kind of... That's 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 how it that's how it went. I mean, even after we made those first tracks, I, I still did all my own stuff. And as I said, I, you know, I did the Legacy in two thousand and four, and and we did the first album together, which was um, Anatomy. Was it Anatomy? Yes. Yeah, Anatomy. Two thousand seven. Two thousand seven. Yeah, and we were still kind of doing things on the side, but then when we was when when we were doing all or nothing, that that, that ended up being the sort of album that that sort of lifted us up to to a whole nother tier. Um, it was just working so well that, 
that, that we decided on um, just just going exclusive for a while and see where we could where we could take it. And the reason it's Calix and TV and not TV and Calix is we we did a coin co coin toss uh, about who was going to go first. And um, I was it was the best of, uh, out of five, and I was two nil up. <laughs> and he won he did three on the three on the roll yeah i was i was gutted for about eight months i think um but now it, it, it rolls up the tongue better and also it helps us on alphabetic billings sure well <laughs> along similar lines because yeah I, I remember that you're saying that story in the past that like the second track you ever did is following the leader which obviously yeah. is a pretty good omen that like yeah we should probably do some more work together yeah. but actually there's an aspect i want to ask about here so when i said that for me if you're in drum and bass at the time this was like this is like Arnold Schwarzenegger and Sylvester Stallone are going to be in a movie together. Like, who wouldn't want to watch that if you're a fan of action movies, right? It's, it's the marquee matchup. So when I heard about this, I have to admit, right, whenever I hear, like, like if you've ever heard of any bands that they make a super group on the side with other, you know, like the, the guitarist from this band and the drummer, it's usually a bit underwhelming because your brain goes, holy crap, what would that be like, those guys together? And obviously, you know, they're not a real band, so probably what they bang out is just, it'll be decent, it'll have something in it, but it's probably not as good as whatever they do in their own bands. Yeah. But I have to say, that first album, Anatomy, for me, I'm not exaggerating, that's my favourite drum and bass album. I think right. almost every track on that, Wow. is a banger i mean there's maybe like one or two tracks towards the end which are support like vortex is a little bit more down tempo you know but all the ones that i like the, the the first six seven tracks in a row these could all be like the a side for someone else's album it, oh, it lives up to the hype Thanks. but this is what i want to ask yeah. on the one hand did you kind of have the same vibe and on the other hand this is the part that kills me tb i used to be a, a poster on dogs and acid like everyone else in the drum oh, bass community right. in the yeah, uk yeah. and so i've got to tell you I could not believe the disconnect between my perception of that album and some of the people on the forums. Because if you remember, yeah. when you were coming to your second album, everyone was flaming that first album. Like, oh, it was all just the same tracks 10 times over. And it was, you know, it was too commercial. I, like, I didn't get that at all, personally. I thought it was a banger. So what what, what was your sense when you first did it? And was were you surprised by some of the sort of almost like nerd backlash against some aspects of it? One thing I've learned from the very start is that the more people who don't like it, it means you're actually, you've actually done something great. Uh, the more people hating, especially at the core of a scene, you know, you have a lot of, you have a lot of keyboard warriors in this scene, as in every scene, but, sure. but like with Anatomy, all we tried to do was to make tracks we wanted to play in our DJ sets. That's all we ever went out to do. We didn't even intend on making an album. We just decided, listen, let's have fun. Let's, let's just go in and do exactly what we want to do. But then again, you know, then we had like 20 things that were started and then we sort of like took away the ones who weren't so solid. And what we realized is just as that, you know, cause a lot of people said it was a bit samey, but that's what we liked about it. There was like, yeah. again, a red line throughout it. it. There was a sound, there was like a message. It was this entity. Let's make it that entity. And, and that's what it is, you know, it, we, we weren't trying to reinvent the wheel or anything. We were just expressing ourselves. And, and at the time as well, we were DJing loads and we were on lineups. We were often sandwiched between Andy C and Ed Rush and Optical or, or you know, Dillinger and Hype. It's like, you, you, you got to come with it. Of course. And, and like, like we had, we had our take on it that was in, you know, very much ours and, and very much a sound that, that yes, I, I drew a lot of influence from, from that wormhole album by Ed Rush and Optical. That is a staple. And, 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 sure. and, and, you know, that album has still to this day is amazing. And, but, but, but more so it, that album just sum, sums up what I was into. I was in my twenties, you know, science fiction, you know, little movie can roads, dangerous stuff, fast stuff, you know, like, like psychedelic stuff. It was, and, and Larry, he was into exactly the same thing. And, 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 and that's why anatomy is what it was like, like the people who, who didn't like it, didn't really care. The album did great. And, and, and it, it sort of cemented both our friendship and our career and, and lifted up another tier, you know? Um, but yeah, that, that's, that's kind of it. There was no, no sort of complex story behind it. We literally only wanted to make tracks. We wanted to play in the clubs. Since, as I said, as solo artists, you particularly were very, very prolific. Obviously, you had your own label, so you just put stuff out whenever you wanted. Like, you don't have to convince someone to buy it. You just, yeah. It's your own label. So one of the questions I want to ask, right, is this is where, if you're a fan of music, you can be very selfish individually in a way that the artist might not experience, which is, I love the Calyx and TV stuff. Like I said, that album, probably my favorite album. Mm. But there's a part of me, now that you don't do the solo stuff, is like, 
fuck, what would the last 10 years of like solo TV be like? What would Kalex's own, a remix only he did sound like? What would that be like? This is a question I have for you, right? As a journalist, yep. one of the things I value as a skill is sometimes you have to be able to try and come up with speculation that could be true even though you have no understanding of it at all. So this is what I want to ask you is this. Yep. As as people who were so prolific on your own, you've got your own philosophy on music, even though there's clearly a shared philosophy that comes together in the dual music, right? I know a little bit about how drum and bass music tends to get produced on people collab. And it very rarely is two people in one studio listening to what you're both doing. I'm doing this, you're doing that. It's usually like, here's something I'm working on, a sketch or something. They add in something. Here's some of the drums I'm going to put in. You send it back. This guy does it. Yep. You know, it's a little bit like that. It's like passing backwards and forwards, right? Yeah. Are there ever times, because there's still a lot of music comes out under the Calyx and TV name. Like I noticed the way you made up for it now is you did lots of remixes. So that's the way you did it when you're not doing the albums. Yeah. So, when it says Calyx and TB or a Calyx and TB remix, is that just the umbrella that covers all the music you're doing in Drombus? Are some of them really just TB made this one or just Calyx did that one? Is there really always collaboration on every track? Um, in most cases, there's a little bit, but it's like sometimes one of us does the majority of the work. Um, but there's... but. But I think when you're making music, it's not so much about who does what. It's about how it ends up. So sometimes just a thought from someone else that you respect as to where you should take it is that vital piece of information that you needed to find your own creativity to take it where the track needed to go. And, and Larry is really good at that. Um, uh, you know, there's remixes I've done on my own that's come out as Calyx and TV. There's, there's, there's no doubt about that. Um, but 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 and also just just to, to, to spiral back a little bit, like all those years that, that, that you talked about, about us being Calyx and TV, I never stopped making solo stuff. But it, it's more of like when I have friends come around and we start making things and and, and you know, like, right. but, but I've been on the contract where I'm not unable to release anything. I've got loads of stuff with my label manager, Chris, for instance, and my, right. my, my power form in Norway. And I also have loads of other different styles of music. Um, I love dub techno and I make a lot of really dubbed out sort of space techno music, but I've not been allowed to release any of it. Um, that is going to change. But, but ultimately, um, those are sketches and, and they're just laying there and sure. one of those sketches will, one element will turn into a Calyx and TV track. And I'm sure without me and Larry really talking about it, I'm sure he has the same. I'm sure he's got loads of ideas and stuff that he's done, but, but we, we were pretty adamant that if we're going to, like, for instance, you can't book a separate, like you have to book. Calyx. Right. You can't just book TV. You can't just book Calyx. At least that's how it's got to be for the, for the time being. And, and it was a conscious decision for the brand. Um, but but do I miss it? Yeah, I miss it. I miss I miss I miss that. I have so much in me that needs to come out, uh, which is also why I've just launched my new podcast series called The Sub Club, and uh, and episode one uh, I dropped it on Friday, um, and that's kind of me getting back to the core of what I am and what I want to represent in a slightly different context where I'm, I'm mixing again, my love for science fiction and, and daydreaming and fantasy and, and gaming and all of that stuff into, into one thing where I'm, I'm creating like an hour or a bit more every month of, of just somewhere where people can go to get away from it all. Um, because that's what music is for me every day. Um, so I'm really excited about that. And also bringing, bringing subtitles, my label, really back this year and um i've got an ep coming as well with my first with a remix of one of my own tracks which is you know which i rarely do um so so there will be a lot more of that coming but but calyx and tv works you know regardless, sure. regardless of regardless of what we do in the future or, or when you know i'm up on my last album with this contract with bmg and ram and and what what happens after this i will never sign away my real name again on any piece of paper i want to be able to have avenues to do whatever i want um outside of it but that's how the record industry i mean it's, it's changed a lot in the last few years but when we signed in 20, 2012 it was seen as a as, as a really good deal the deal we got then and if you look at the deals being made right now and due to the climate of how people consume music and how much less income there actually is from both physical products and and you know streaming i could talk for hours about that but i'm not gonna because i'll be negative <laughs> um it's like you know i think the time is right 
again, and also I'm a place in my life. I'm, I'm, I'm 43 this year and I have, there's so much more that needs to come out. So, so me and Larry have already had this conversation about Calix and TV. That's, that's there. It's n- never going anywhere. But I think we both could do small things left or right down the line, or even we, we would collaborate on, on products in other, other genres, which we have done already. Sure. We haven't been able to release it. And, and, and for me, for instance, I want to make music in other genres, but I don't want to go and DJ it, you know? Right. So it's like I'm going to create new names for a few of my other projects and, and, and such. But, 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 you know, me and Larry, he's, he's my brother, man. You know, I'll, I'll still be working with him in 40 years' time. Sure. So actually, along those lines, another thing you did in interviews for many, many years is you would always, basically, I'll tell you that it's like to be a, a, someone who's following your career, is whenever you're in an interview, you reveal that you're working on an album, you always initially make the scope of it sound so insane and ambitious. And when the album comes out, it could never be like that because, it, you know, like, it, 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 like you may always make it sound like, listen, it's not just going to be drum and bass. It's also going to have like, you know, operatic elements in it. It's going to have hip hop in it. It's going to have jazz in it. And it's like, you know, I would say for all or nothing, you accomplished some of that. That was quite experimental at times. Even some of the tracks that are just drum and bass have elements to it that are that are definitely outside of the subgenre you'd expect. Yeah. But you clearly want to do this aspect. Do you feel like you haven't fully been able to express that yet then? Oh, yeah. I mean, All or Nothing was going to be a double album. It was going to be half drum and bass, half other genres of music. And we had 70% of those other genres now. But we realized four years into that album project, literally, you know, going out of our minds because of of, of the, the, the scope of music and the length of it all. Like, you know, we were approaching three and a half hours worth of, of music. Uh, and we realized that the scope of it, as far as the, the more 4-4 stuff or like, you know, the deeper stuff or like the slower stuff or the dubby stuff or whatever it was, <coughs> excuse me, um, that we had to just cut it loose. Like it, it, it hasn't gone anywhere. It's still there. Uh, all the music is still there, but, but all or nothing, we had to, we had to seriously sort of sit and think, how can we make this work and, and how can we make it the best sort of viable way of for touring? And, 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 and after loads of, <clears throat> after loads of, 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 of gathering information and getting other opinions, we decided that this is what we do. And like, if we start confusing our fans for what they're expecting, we might shoot ourselves in the foot. And at the time, sure. that was a luxury we didn't have. So, so we, we've yet to decide on a name for some of the other stuff we have, but we have piles of music and it's just laying there and we never stop making other stuff. Like my favorite stuff to make is ambient. I have hours of it, but I've never released any. Um, and and, and in, a, in a way I like it because that means that I haven't forgotten the essence of why I'm doing this, which, is, which essentially is for me. Yeah. Well, you know, along those lines, actually, one thing, if you ever had any interest in doing this, I'd definitely be interested in listening to was I remember when as part of like, I think it was part of like a Radio 1 set, you did like a, a minimal techno yeah, it was uh, like section to it. Yes, exactly. The essential mix. You're right. Yeah. And there was like a solid like 30 minute section of this, yeah. which wasn't drum and bass. And in fact, that's not really my genre of music, mate. Like I used to like trance, you know, in the 90s, yeah. some of that because, you know, it's very melodic, etc. Cool. But I'd never listened to some of this stuff. And so obviously, you know i gave it a chance and yeah. it was obviously it was very well mixed because that's kind of the, your thing so i could easily see you could easily as a side project do do that sort of stuff yeah and, and that's that's what i'm doing as well that's sort of like like that essential mix because when you when you get an essential mix from radio one it's like you have arrived and it's a badge of honor and you've got to respect that and that mix nearly killed us but we're really really proud of it we, we were up for essential mix of the year as well with that one and we came second to Nicholas Char, but, but his was mind blowing. Fair enough. <laughs> yeah, his was mind blowing. Um, but so, so yeah, it, it definitely like 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 my influences. I think for me, there's nothing more boring than drum and bass inspired by drum and bass. It, it's like if, if you're going to be a fourth generation producer, and the only thing you've listened to are the three generations before. Yes, you're going to get influences from other genres, but you have to <clears throat> you have to find your own and contribute to it by pulling that in that's what keeps this music is alive is is drawing from whatever else is going on in your life and and, and your other influences whether it's you, the music your parents introduced you to or other things that's why it's here because it's a, it's it's a culture based on 
on on on sort of getting everything together and just like mixing it up into something quite naughty you know like like that's 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 drum and bass and 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 with the essential mix we had we, we try to reflect that we put in a lot of tracks that we were listening to at the moment especially with the four four section that was tracks i was really feeling in that genre at the moment but there's some dj shadow on there there's old j dilla there is uh, like the orb there is even a, a a piece from the blade runner soundtrack you know like um we, we, we just drew it because I listen to a lot of film music and, 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 and scores. That's I think film scores and it's probably where I draw my mo the most of my inspiration from. Um, love Vangelis. Um, um, well, actually, on that on that angle, I want to ask you something about that. So if you're someone where I know when you say that you were interested in doing film scores, it was actually t your, you to go out of your comfort zone into that world and put your imprint on that. But actually, I still feel like, mate, what there is there, there are movie directors out there who because they don't really know drum and bass especially in america you know it's still not that big a thing like people don't people often mistake the genre even i feel like there is a massive untapped potential to have drum and bass soundtracks to movies like how have some of these people not figured out because listen a lot of them like they love to put like a prodigy track over you know a fight scene or a chase scene they a lot of them haven't figured out you put on like all that remains or something put some track like that behind a scene like that the energy will be amazing Absolutely. I mean, there was a few scarce attempts attempts in the nineties, like the end credits of Blade was actually sure. Energy Ryu. And remember that little sequence when one of the vampires are listening in headphones, and you can just the hear source it. direct track call and, and response. It it's call and response. It's baller, isn't it? Yeah. And now, for me, I was in the mood theater. My mind was blown right now. It just makes the aesthetic, doesn't it? You think yeah. this vampire is the coolest motherfucker ever? <laughs> exactly. So, so it's like yes, definitely. But I think there's there's there's, there's social aspects and cultural aspects behind that too, because America is the one continent in all, in the whole world which haven't fully embraced his music, and that's the whole yeah. of Hollywood. Um, like, you can get away with, with small things, but you can't get away. Like, I've been offered to, to score things and, and, and turn a few things down. I've done a few things under the radar, which I can't talk about because of non-disclosure stuff. Uh, but, but it's like... It, at the moment as well, even just last week, I had I had a guy hit me up about about, about helping to score this other thing. And, and it seems like it's something I could be doing more in the future. And I, and I have a goal. It's on my list. I will. I want to score. A I want to score movies and I want to do it my way. And, and I want to represent drum and bass music in that. But but okay. uh, but but as if and when it will happen. I mean, if you look at Fotech at the moment, like he doesn't do any drums drummer bass anymore he's solely a a, a a scorer for for tv series he does how to get away with murder um he's, he's the one scoring that series which is a big hit series in the states and and he kind of positioned himself where he didn't want to dj he wanted to have a family all of that stuff and and and, and he was like right how can i make a decent living living still making music i love so he entered that world and and you know when when my legs are sort of start starting to give in and I'm less inclined to go away every weekend. I could see myself doing that. Um, and also games, you know, because games sure. are quite elaborate. Yes. Um, like Noisia did Devil May Cry. Uh, they told me it was a nightmare, but they still enjoyed it. You know, it, it, there's more of that coming up and, and it's definitely stuff I'd like to do. And I really think to, like, for instance, Altered Carbon. Imagine if that series had like a really sort of like desolate, drum and bass soundscape, soundscape like like sort of playing along the whole thing it would just give it a whole nother dimension absolutely but you put you pop some sense. like classic you know alaska or some yeah. sort of intelligent drum bit that'd be amazing yeah. the aesthetic could be there but then again would it make it less successful and i guess that's why sure that's that's kind of you know no one's willing to take that risk but i think it's a risk that needed to be taken i think the world's totally ready for it yeah right uh, being as there's a million tracks I could ask for some like nerdy story behind. There's yeah. one that I picked out that I want to ask you about because there's a track TB. No one ever asks you about, no one ever brings it up. And, but I think this is the most slept on drum and bass track of all time. And it's the collaboration you did with Noisia called Moon Palace. Oh. This track, if you want to pick a track that it doesn't matter, like put it this way, I guarantee you I could go and get a bunch of drum and bass heads now who haven't heard this track yeah. and tell them, guess the year. And they are never going to guess TB that it's over 10 years old like this the sounds on this track still sound amazing it's got so much nuance to it and subtlety it's a really slow build but it's really satisfying where it goes 
What was this scenario like? Because again, this is like a dream collab, but again, that you yeah. worry, will, will it live up to, you know, Noisier and TB? Yeah, I mean, that was so early on in Noisier's career. Like, I, I was the first label to pick up Noisier uh, on subtitles. And, and I remember they had a gig and, and, and they didn't, they weren't listed with the label. And that was the same week I talked to them on the phone and they, they brought their own markers and they wrote subtitles behind their name. <laughs> okay. uh, and it was shortly after that, I actually traveled down to Groningen because I was like, these three guys are fascinating. And, and I traveled down with a bunch of sounds, brought my projector, PS, PS2 at the time, and a few things, you know, these young guys kind of sharing something that look a bit like, a, a, you know, like where students live and, and, and but, but they were amazing. And so we did two tracks. We did Lost Course. No, we did three in those four days I was there. We did Lost Course, we did Moon Palace, and we did Time Stops. And with Moon Palace, you know, they love they love Black Science Labs is 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 some of those guys. That's one of their favorite albums ever, and it's what sort of brought them into the music, and um, and hence that's why they 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 wanted to get on subtitles and send me send me music and, and such. And when we came down and started working like with Moon Palace. I just had loads of stuff that I'd made, but as in as in soundbanks, and I just gave it all to Nick. And Nick Nick sat there for like a day going through what he loved, and he got it all in a folder. And then I spent the same time he was doing that. I spent a lot of time listening to things they've made, and just gathered that. And and then we went back to the pot, and the pot was overwhelmingly big, um, and we were so sleep deprived. And 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 all kinds of things and but but that track just happened we didn't intend for anything like everything in that track was completely natural like everything we chucked in or everything we tried just worked and and then because that went so well like like moon palace and yes i'm really proud of that track and it's coming up to a, to a million youtube views though isn't it could be yeah, yeah I think because you, because you know, like yes, it definitely slept on, but it has a life, and 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 it's been been and it's been going. And you're not the first to tell me you love that track, and that's a special track to to me too. I, I'd forgotten about it, and a couple of weeks ago, I just did a self indulgence YouTube binge of myself when I was feeling bad about everything. <laughs> okay. And uh, and that track, I ended up repeating it and thinking, wow, I've forgotten. And, and I, I got my phone out and I started writing notes about things we did in that track that that necessarily isn't conventional thinking for me at this present point. Um, but like that, that does sound to me like, you know, it's like an avenue people could have gone down, but you just yeah. went there briefly and then you came back out. Yes, yes, but it's, it's definitely an avenue that needs more exploring. And that, that avenue as well is more, that sounds more like the stuff I do that doesn't get released, you know? Right. Like that, that's the stuff that... Look, when I make music for me, that's not Calyx and TV and it's not going to have to fit a certain bracket or anything. Not that I, in, that I don't enjoy doing things to fit in a box, but like if I'm doing it for me, it, it tends to be of a certain style. And I guess, I guess a lot of me shines through in that track, but also a lot of what Noisier loved from my earlier records and they wanted to make something like it. And, and all of a sudden they could because I was there with them. So they went just went to town and I was like, man, these guys are amazing, you know, like like they they just they just they just got it and 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 we've we've been great friends ever since. But that track that called Time Stops that came out in subtitles a little bit later, that was a funny one. We made it in four hours and, and there's a little sort of scratching sound just as I'm about to leave, we're trying to wrap up the track, I have to run to the station. We've been up for two days straight. This bongo fell out of the closet, and I was like, that's a sign. I was like, get a mic <laughs> and, and, and he just grabbed, he grabbed the mic, he, he held it in front of his bongo instead of playing it. Cause I come from hip hop. I scratched it. Like I was scratching a record right. with my nail. And that's that rhythmical thing that comes into it. And when Nick and we, I didn't have anything playing back to it, nothing. And when Nick from Noisia dumped it in, 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 in Cubase, he was like, he just looked at me with massive eyes. It was in time and perfectly in key. And that is the glorious moment. I've ever had making music because it was just so random, nothing planned. It just a bongo fell out of the closet and I scratched it instead of playing for it in a rhythm and we dumped it in the track and that's what made the track. Right. I realize some of the questions I'm going to ask here towards the end of the interview 
are somewhere you could probably answer for half an hour on these ones. So I realize we've got time constraints, but I'll ask them anyway. And I'll just say it as a preamble. One of the things I'm quite famous for in the esports world when I do interviews is I really do think you can ask someone any question. It's how you ask the question. So I don't believe in topics that are like sacred cows. So in line with that, right, I'm going to be very careful how I ask this question, but... You are someone where if I listen to the music you do in the early 2000s, it's totally your entire sound. No one else was even doing a sound in that particular way. Sure, there's elements of Edruction Optical and Fortec and people that inspired you, but you're doing your own thing completely. And as I said, especially when you had that like more limited sound bank, it's very much like you can tell every track. There's obviously a TV track. You wouldn't even need to see the track label. But... Over the years, we had people come along who came from drum and bass and had this massive crossover success. Obvious examples, Pendulum, Chase and Status, I'd say at the current moment, Wilkinson. These are great examples of people where they even retain some of the elements of what the hardcore fan liked, but somehow they make it accessible to anyone. And these people, I mean, I, I've always said this, half of the problem drum and bass has is... Every kid I know who was like 10 years younger than me likes Pendulum. They just don't understand that like, you know, there's a lot of other music like that if you like it. Like, it's not just Pendulum, mate. You don't have to wait for their next album for 10 years. Check out this stuff, you know. Right, this is the question. As someone who thinks of himself as an artist, if I'm as an outsider being cynical, it does look at times like the success that these people had commercially maybe had an influence on you? Maybe made you think like, oh, I'll try something in that area or I want to have a chart hit like that. Is is there some truth to that? Like, I don't want it to sound like, you know, you gave up your integrity. It's a part of doing business. Was there an element of that? Well, let's put it this way. Me and Larry had a conversation and the finishing line of that conversation was, let's go dance with the devil for a couple of years. <laughs> okay, well, that, I think you've summed it up. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. That's pretty much it. So yeah, totally nailed it. Like we went for it, got a Radio 1 A-list, like Elevate This Sound, by far our biggest single ever, by far our biggest tune, transcends the genre. Trevor Nelson played it 26 consecutive shows in a row. Uh, and that's Trevor Nelson, you know, like sure. Mr. Hip Hop and R&B. Yes. Uh, and, and I remember especially like he played it a few times and I tweeted him at the time. And, and he basically, after he played it, he, he paused and he went, I love this track. And, you know, I grew up with Trevor Nelson. Like, sure. That's really kind of, because of, we set out to do something else. Like, how can we push this further? Like, all my music is there. All the credibility is there. I honestly believe that my love for this culture um, is so strong and so apparent that if I go and do something to try and make some money, I didn't sell out. I try to challenge sure. myself, compete with those people doing it. And and be, I'm not doing it right now, but but when we did, like when we do the vocal things, of course, man, like Long Gone, for instance, you know, that whole guitar riff that Larry came up with an intro could have been Sting, you know? Uh, and it's like, you know, strung out as well. You know, just these vocal things, that's another dimension to what we can do. You know, we grow up, we we change our tastes as to what we love. Like, if I were to do the same thing again and again, I'd go crazy, which, which is a paradox in itself because essentially it's what I'm doing. But the outcome is slightly different. Uh, so, so yeah, it's totally true. Like, went for it for a while, um, decided it wasn't for us because the crowds we were playing to as well um wasn't what we were about you we ended up on a lot of lot of bigger shows especially in unis and such and there was just a disconnect that we we, we couldn't really um get to grips with but as we followed into one x one or like one by one as that album's called the second album we did for ram after all or nothing which has a fair bit of vocal tracks on it sure. and also <coughs> come some more commercial collaborations with with other artists, some of those tracks didn't do as well as we thought they would. They they didn't achieve what we wanted to as far as radio playlists and stuff. Yes, Zane Lowe had one as his world record on 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 beats on, on you know on 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 Apple uh, Radio, and we had also um, the hottest record in the world from Annie Mac. But it's like that's not what we aspired to, and we also felt a slight disconnect from certain parts of the scene with some of those tracks, uh, which which again sparked the debate of. We're not really guys you can A&R. If you try yeah. and A&R us into something that we're not, the, the result isn't going to feel as profound as when we get full creative freedom. So so we return to that. And, and yes, maybe we, 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 we got a couple of dents 
into our integrity. But that was something I'm, I'm willing to sacrifice. And also, as a 43 year old, I couldn't give give less of a shit. Yes. Yeah. It, uh, and but in, in say in saying all of that, our fees got higher, which is what we aim for. You know, yeah. we make more money. It was like I have a family. You know, I'm I was the sole provider for for many years, and. And with that comes responsibilities. So you've got to make money. And, and then Well, I'll give you an analogy, mate. Okay, one thing that I once heard, and this helped me in my own career, because I had the, exactly the same problem in the esports world. I used to try to be the most hardcore fan yeah. and writer and everything. And what that meant was, yeah, I catered to the hardcore people. But then as, the, as our field got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, I didn't always have all the same connection with the more casual fan. And so what I actually remember hearing was, I remember hearing uh, this story that the director, Steven Soderbergh, the guy who did like Traffic, a bunch of classic movies, apparently he literally has said in interviews that his system is, he goes to the studio and he tells them, right, here's, I'll, I'll t pick out a script for me and I'll do a blockbuster for you. I'll do a movie like Traffic that could be like, you know, could win an Oscar or be the movie of the year. And then in, in exchange for that, each time I do that, you let me do a project that I want to do. And it's like, basically, you know, you give the devil his due on one hand and that then allows you to do whatever you want, which could be a really bizarre indie movie, a small artistic movie. Might be some of that will never make money. But the idea is the two actually can balance each other out. Like one is, it's almost like a necessary evil in a way. Mm. Absolutely, man. Because here's the thing. The reason why I wanted to ask that question about like the commercial aspect, and yeah. I think in some ways in this interview, actually you provided some interesting background, like the fact that you have kept doing lots of music that you couldn't release. And it's not yeah. even that you didn't want to, you just couldn't. Because here's the, this is where the disconnect, I think, happens, TB, is you are someone, as you said before, you definitely don't hold back your opinions. Like you yeah. definitely sometimes go on Twitter to have a grumble about stuff. One of the things that's obviously a classic TB gripe is to be like, drum and bass, you know, it's lost a bit of its soul, you know, where's sort of like some of the artistic expression. And the problem is, TB, if people just hear some of the very commercial remixes that you've done, they're going to go, what? Aren't, aren't you doing some of that, teams? Aren't, aren't you part of that world? Mm -hmm. Oh, mate, that's, that's just totally true. I mean, I mean, I think, I think I'm, I'm, as I'm getting to grips with social media, having partially grown up with it in my 20s, in many, in many ways, some things you should keep for yourself, you know, and like a lot of those gripes that I have usually come from places of frustration. And sure. if, if, um, if I feel that what really should be getting the exposure isn't getting it. Yes. You know, I'm as guilty as anyone of, of, of sometimes being a bit negative and, and also, you know, I am a bit loud. I am a bit abrasive. I was the first guy outside of the UK to penetrate the notoriously tight UK scene. That was that was really, really, really hard work for me. Um, I even had to get a haircut and go to Hastings for a language course because, you know, this isn't my accent. I'm Norwegian. I had to. And when I first got signed as well, it's like I had to be I had to pretend to be English. I remember when I won my first knowledge award, I wasn't al allowed to compete with the UK. They, they made a separate um, category for people outside the UK. So it was best international producer. Right. When I won it in 2000, I was ecstatic. But in hindsight, I was so angry that they had to put me in a separate category where I couldn't work, where I wasn't deemed good enough to compete with the guys from the UK, the originators. So I, get, I guess in, 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 in many ways, I've had to fight tooth and nail for every little bit I've gotten from this but in doing so and I'm very proud of this I, I opened up for everyone that came after yes uh, and, and and now drum and bass is truly like a global phen phenomenon and, and some of the biggest artists are not from the UK um, but I think that's part of my gripes as well because I come from the real core like no one should ever question what I love like my favorites are still total science like Mako DLR you know like 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 one mind like like the people that most people don't even know who is but that's the core of the music i always keep my ear to the ground and i always i always look for progression and there's always some young kid that's inspiring me that i get in touch with like for instance there's this american guy called tekel at the moment and he's blowing my mind and he's on subtitles and he's someone i've now worked with for three years sort of guiding and he's really come into his own and and and, and i think also i'm at a a point of time in my career and in my life where I want to take a bit more responsibility. I want to involve myself a bit more with all these young talents that need to be heard. And if, if I can use my platform to push some of that, 
that's you know that's my duty this music and culture has given me so much and, and and hence why i'm bringing really bringing subtitles back because i want i want the label my label to be a voice of those kids that i want people to hear you know so so even if i dabble with you know remixing stuff for money or you know making tracks to be played on the radio that doesn't mean that i don't love what this is about it just sure. means that I have the talent and the skill to maybe go and make a bit more money. And this is the only thing I do. This is the only income I have. And I'd be stupid not to. Sure. Right. At the end of this interview, do you have yeah. anything you would like to promote that's coming up? Anyone you want to thank or say hello to? I want to say massive thank and big ups to Larry, my partner in crime, Calix. Love you, dude. <laughs> he, uh, he, um, we've got a new album coming. Uh, the first single is coming next month. It's called War Dub, and um, it's currently doing the, right, the round on dub plates. And it's us getting back to the core of what we love on this record, like really getting back to the core of it, like stripping it back. It's basically the tracks are finished when we can't remove anymore. That's what it is. Like the core of it has to be the essence of it. Also, my, my, my new podcast, The Sub Club, uh, it's on every platform. Um, you just put in uh, The Sub Club or subtitles in iTunes. It's on my SoundCloud. It, it's it's on Spotify. That's going to be a new monthly show from me where I represent what I believe should be heard in the culture. And that pretty much sums it up. Okay. Toos and tack. Oh, that's good. Pleasure talking to you, man. And um, let's do part two at another time.